Um, we're excited that you're all here to talk a little bit about uh, what our committee does and also maybe to brainstorm collaboratively as a group as we, um, and you'll understand what I'm talking about as we get to some of our prompter questions. Hi, Bill. Happy birthday. Bill! Happy birthday! Um, you can still say hello. Okay, so we are, uh, we always say CDC because the UCC likes acronyms, but that stands for Church Development Committee. And I'm Susan, I'm one of the members who each one introduces ourselves. Where are you from? Oh, and I go to Normandy Park um, Congregation uh, and Church of Christ. We're the closest church to the airport and the southern most Seattle church. Oh, I'm Mary Miller. I'm um, going off CDC. I graduated, so this is my last gathering, but I'm from Woodenville, North Shore, UCC. I'll go next. I'm Dave Parker, and I'm fresh on CDC. This is my first term, and I am also from Woodenville, North Shore, UCC. Dan Stern from Broadview in Seattle. And, uh, Chair. Co-chair. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Becky Rivington, I'm the vice chair or co-chair of the Church Sometimes. Development Committee and um, I go to Everett United Church of Christ. Um, awesome. So our, com our committee is made up of folks from all over the conference. There is 12 of us, roughly, um, and we're tasked with um, three different things. So. Our first task is helping churches looking for renewal grants um, and looking for renewal projects. So for, I mean, we'll give some examples of that. But if you're a church who um, has a cool idea about something and needs some funds, we're a group that you work with. If you're a church that's just looking for um, someone to partner with you and walk you through that process, maybe just be a be a prayer or um, be it some of us showing up to give uh, non-biased opinions or to be um, just in Christian friendship, that's us. So that's our first task. Our second task is affiliation. So churches that are um, maybe already in existence and meeting but looking to join a denomination or looking to match um, the UCC with who they are. Uh, we partner with them in that process. And then our third task is new church starts. So folks that um, either want to do a church plant, um, being somewhere that doesn't have a UCC church, or they're looking to do church in a new way and want to be affiliated with the UCC. So those are the three areas that um, church development works with folks. We get our monies through, is it strengthening the church, correct? Through OCWM, part of it comes from strength of the church, part of it comes from investments on the existing funds. Okay. So uh, if your church does the five campaigns, strengthen the church, I'm not going to look at it. I'm of sharing strength of the church, neighbors in need, um, Christmas fund, and OCWM, um, which is our church's wider mission. So through uh, the Strength in the Church campaign, when we give at the local church level in our conference, that money ends up coming, or at least half that money, pardon me, ends up coming back to our committee, and that's what we use to give out grants. We also, the so invest, yeah, so the investment fund then that our conference has had for a long, long time that earns a little bit at a time, that money also gets, um, is under our committee, and we're able to use that as well. And I shouldn't say just grants. Sometimes what we do is loans. So uh, we should introduce Michelle. And um, she's yeah. the, she's the one you know. Michelle, whose title I don't know, but works at our conference office and is our financial guru. So if we keep looking at her for information, that would be one. Okay, I'm just crashing the party. I'm the accounting manager. Who's done an amazing job at clarifying all of the money that have come in the last few years. Um, yeah, so I think what's cool about our committee is that uh, we get to do these three different things. We get to do them together as a group. We get to help other churches in our conference. We get to go visit other churches in our conference. And we get to think 
um, outside of the box a lot. And so during the course of the next hour, we're going to talk about how we do those different things. And I'm going to turn, and we're going to start with the renewal piece, and I'm going to turn the um, floor over to Beth. Okay. Um, so I thought the main thing I would do is just give some examples of renewal activities that we've helped churches with in recent past. And then we'll have some time um, for discussion, thoughts that you have about church renewal, resources that would be helpful to you for church renewal, wherever you want to take the conversation after that. So um, one of the recent grant cycles that we've been working on is Forever United Church of Christ. And that was um, actually before I became the pastor there. Mm -hmm. um, and so the different things that uh, they applied for grant money for that the church development committee were able to help with were uh, upgrading the sound system in the church, building a ramp up to the chancel so the chancel is now accessible, and a communications plan with new business cards, updated website, and that kind of thing. And that was over a period of two years, uh, two separate grants, and uh, that is sort of the classic, typical type of grant work that the Church Development Committee has done. Sometimes things take a slightly different direction. We helped Kirkland United Church of Christ in their first year do some things around putting windows in the um, doors of the uh, Sunday school classrooms, safe church type stuff, and also accessibility in terms of widening door frames to make them accessible. And after that was put in motion with the first year of grant money they applied for, and the maximum is three years. Then in their second year, they um, had their pastor accept a call elsewhere and really wanted to take stock of where they were as a community. And so they, um, instead of applying for another year of funding for capital improvements, they used the money to hire a consultant who worked with them extensively and actually for a period of time, they gave up Sunday worship and instead of worshiping on Sundays, they met with this consultant and that was their community work over a period of maybe three months. Well, I think they still worship, but that was the focus. The of focus, the yeah, so they, the had, they had worship and then this kind of, um, consultant work, and that ended up being a partial grant and a partial loan. So that's an example of a church having a vision and getting funding, but then wanting to reevaluate and see where other needs might be as they progress through the grant cycle. Um, and then there are the less formal situations. For example, Japanese Congregational Church in Capitol Hill, I worked with them meeting with them quarterly for a period of time and they just wanted to brainstorm ideas. We have a few resources, um, one of which I passed out as a handout with permission of the Center for Progressive Renewal, um, Characteristics of Thriving Churches, books I recommended. They wanted to work on their website but um, didn't have a web person, so we talked about um, community center, courses, informal courses that they could get the training they needed for someone to work on their website. So I was more of a consultant and they didn't have a large project that they wanted a grant for. So that's an example of that. And then the other thing we do around renewal is mini grants. The big grants are typically maybe a thousand dollars to three thousand dollars um, for one year in the cycle. Many grants might be $250, $500. Do you might, wanna... Well, it might be even more than that sometimes. I mean, it's... Uh, can be larger. Yeah. 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 Eight or 9000 yeah. a year. Yeah. Okay. So um, the many grants are typically less than $1,000, and those are um, to send somebody to a conference on church renewal or to sign up for one of those online classes from Center for, for Progressive Renewal, that type of thing. So there's the big grants and loans, the mini grants, and then kind of supportive and consulting services. And in terms of resources, what we call the toolkit, the renewal toolkit, um, right now we have documents that we can send to people electronically, but two of the CDC members are also developing a website 
where churches in our conference, probably anywhere in the UCC, will just be able to go there and grab documents um, like this one, for example. So I hope that gives you a good idea and what questions do you have or what do you want to talk about when it comes to renewal? So if we wanted to, say, pursue the mini grant, contact the committee directly? Mm -hmm. or do we work with the yeah. In any case, you would contact the committee directly for a larger, more formal grant after a, discussing your project informally, then there's a grant application, which is still not as arduous as, you know, applying to the, for a Pew grant or something. But for many grants, it's very informal, um, just like a one-page information sheet about what you're going to use the money for. And, um, so that's a very informal process. It might be worth just saying briefly that there's not an evangelism committee per se. We're probably the closest. So a lot of what we're alluding to is building covenantal conversations about what works. And 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 it, it, a lot of emphasis on the grants, but that's not the only thing we want to be about. And increasingly, we've been about, you know, well, we get into road trips and 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 making contact with churches just to delve in, and with each other. I mean, it's a great team to just wrestle with uh, what works to make a church grow, uh, what what do we need, what, what are those kind of factors. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with, do with the electronic toolkit, is put success stories and best practices and those types of documents up so that people um, can see what's good for other churches in our conference. Or did you? Does that stimulate some or questions or comments? because we wanted to make sure it was yours, not just us yakking at you. And also maybe like what renewal ideas has your church kicked around? How, when you're evaluating, do I say, my name is Andrew, I'm from uh, Bellingham. The, when you're talking about the things that work, how do you evaluate that? When the, I mean, if, if you're talking about a church that's, I mean, there are, I'm, I'm trying to envision the way that it would look on paper. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to assign a, you know, I don't know, I guess they'll just give you free form to it, 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 that. It's a huge assignment, isn't it? And, and every church is unique, and there's not a cut and dry thing that works for everybody, clearly. And we know all of the different cultures and many cultures. We're wrestling with that, and, and it's a process, it's not a finished product. But in terms of evaluating what works, um, besides, you know, metrics, quantitative information, there's just, um, has the church embraced this and is there a sense among the congregation that the spirit is at work enlivening what's going on at the church besides sheer numbers of new people coming in the door? Um, if you apply for a second year of grant or loan or a third year, um, there's a process where you make a report on what you've done and we just discuss that together in a supportive way, the church community and the committee. And then Mike Denton has um, three specific things. I never remember the this three. This is a quiz. Words. This is a quiz. You all need to know this That's before right. you can leave this room. <laughs> What are they? Can we say them? Uh, Self-sustaining. Self-sustaining. Self-perpetrating. Perpetrating. Perpetuating. Okay, Perpetuating. Perpetuating. Don't tell Mike. <laughs> and self-governing. But basically, it. Um, yeah. does it um, <laughs> increase the autonomy and viability and right. agency of the community? And kind of the main thing around those concepts of Mike's is um, not creating a relationship of dependency. Okay. But, um, you know, teaching people to fish, giving them tools to fish. What an example might be, um, and, and it often evolves from year to year, but usually if someone makes a, a grant proposal, there's a place on the grant to say, how are you going to, what's success going to look like for you, or how are you going to measure whether things are happening? Right. Um, and um, and then it can be as simple as surveys. It can be numbers or finances or it's really we work with the church to say okay and, we, and actually 
um, for either a grant or not a grant, but just thinking through some of the processes. Some of these churches have also just come and talked through. Um, so I just said, we're not sure what our problem is, or we're not sure what we need to do. And then we literally have like a one or two hour session where we just say, so tell us what it is. And in the process of, of defining their situation for us, then they begin to kind of clarify, and then they usually go away, and then they come back. Um, we have multiple meetings often, or we go out there. And um, usually, also, each church has kind of a mentorship. Um, Don Hansen, John Hansen, they, you know, never actually was a crisis church. They were talking about closing. And so Don Hansen became their mentor, and he actually physically went there once a month and met with them. And then things, you know, whether it's accessible, and yes, now we're accessible so that people can get in. Um, Mary? Yeah. I was just going to mention, while we're talking about my church, we've got a couple members here we love. Yes. And <laughs> Becky, and maybe you want to share a little bit of your Yeah, I can, I can tell you what the process is. Um, I was actually part of Everett's, at that point in time, we were the first congregational church in Everett. Yes. Um, part of our rebirthing is that we changed our name to Everett UCC because we were a United Church of Christ, we were not a congregational church. So part of our new birthing and, and coming back to life was renaming ourselves and reestablishing ourselves in the community. We worked very, very, very close with Don. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> a hard one. Yeah. He recently, he was um, a member of our yeah. committee. He was the and he recently was killed in a, um, an accident. Very, a very freak, freak accident. Lots of, <laughs> very freak accident and lots of folks in our conference. So anyway, one of the things we did with, with Don is um, he, he just gave us a lot of ideas, but one of the things we did when we first formed our committee was um, we put together a survey that we gave out to everybody in the church. And amazingly enough, especially being in UCC Church, we had a 95% return rate on the survey. Wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, um, and what we did was is we put it to the congregation of you know, what do you feel we're doing right? What do we need to work on? Where do you want to see us go? You know, what, what do you want our vision to be? And by, by going through this, we identified some key things. Um, some of the problems that we have, and you know, small churches, big churches, everybody does this, is you get a core group of people that are there, for, you know, that, that run the church, basically. Well, the communication may be fine with that group, but it doesn't get put out to the congregation. So that little group thinks, oh, everybody's in the know. Well, the congregation doesn't know what's in the know. So one of the things we did was we really made a concentrated effort that every step of the way when we went through the whole the whole grant process, all the writing we were doing, I mean, when we applied for the grant, we were doing, uh, doing the survey, we really, really pushed communication and getting everybody back involved in it and being realistic. This is where we are. This is reality. You know, this is what we're dealing with money-wise. This is what we're dealing with with the building. This is what needs to be done to keep, you know, to keep the doors open. Um, and having people just really not coming from a fear place, but coming from a knowledge place that when we really understood where we were at and what we were really looking at reality-wise, we knew where to go. So everybody in the whole congregation was on the same page. And by doing that, and then by applying for the grant, we figured out what was important. Well, what was important was the sales system. There was a lot of people that with, you know, with hearing disabilities, we have some of the members that have hearing disabilities, um, just, you know, other people coming in that you, you really couldn't hear the message. So it was a focus with redoing the sound system. So, we, you know, we got the choir mic, we, did, we redid our entire sound system in the church. And it was really great because when we started working in, with companies to get these bids, when they found out what we were doing, a lot of them gave us things at cost. They gave us free labor. I mean, they bought in, they understood what we were doing for the community when they realized what our church is for Everett. Um, we have a lot of, we kind of joke sometimes, we're like, we're the AA church of the entire of Snohomish County. Um, we're the only open and affirming church of Snohomish County. So we have PFLAG, we have Snow Globe, we have the youth groups. We have a dinner bill program that started off with maybe 20 people that were up to 100 people a week. 
Uh, we have an elementary school that has 17 different languages spoken at this school. Um, English is a secondary language for all of these kids. A lot of these kids, the only food they get is at school. And they realized over the weekend these kids weren't getting food. We started a backpack program. People bring in food and fill in the backpacks with stuff that they can eat over their own on the weekends. I mean, our, we have just, I mean, we're a small congregation. I think we're about 100 people right now. We do the work of a congregation that's maybe 500. Because with getting that communication out there, people like, here's a need, here's a need, here's a need. Everybody finds that one little thing that they can do. And it makes such a huge, big difference. And, we're, and, and the grant was part of this. Um, we worked, we got all the computer systems in. We had, our computer systems were so antiquated. It literally took half an hour to go down. You would turn, hit the on button, and then come back half an hour later, and maybe you could log on it when you're ready. So we had, um, I was part of the computer thing. We've got two, uh, two other people in our, in our church that are computer geekies too, that um, between the three of us, we came up, we redesigned the, we designed the webpage for our church because we realized a lot of people, I mean, that's how I found UCC Church when I was like up on the web, right? Um, so we redesigned our webpage. We have our sermons out on the webpage. I mean, it was just, it's just an on, an ongoing thing. So you're kind of, you know, we have our, we have our own geek spot. Yes, <laughs> yes. We have our own many geek for Jesus, but just going through the whole, and then what we did is, so after, um, so every step of the way we kept the congregation informed. When we, when we did, completed our first year of the grant, we went back voluntarily to the CDC committee and gave a report, and at that point in time, nobody had ever done that. They're like, oh, you guys are telling us. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, this is a good idea. <laughs> We're a <evolving. laughs> so, <laughs> so we applied for the second year. We actually had a marketing person came out um, and met with us. It was one evening during the week, and about 80% of the church showed up for it um, and met with us and gave us different ideas and stuff, and we took that input and then we went and developed what fit for us. So we got a professional's input on it, but it was like, yeah, you're coming from, we took what was good from the corporate and then we took what was good from the faith and we combined it and made it for something that worked for us. So I'm gonna see if anybody else has any questions or examples or wants to throw out your wild and crazy dreams um, before we move on to a <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say, because I came into the church after all the crisis stuff was over with, and, um, and so I kind of missed on, on some of that part, <laughs> but, but I can tell you what the watershed is of that, and that is that we, as we have new members coming in now, because we have so much better communication in the church, we have new members who are showing up at committee meetings, you know, who are looking for places to fit in not just coming to church on Sunday and then going home and watching whatever game it is that is sports for that season. You know, um, there the people are signing up to do things like that, things, other things about the church. And, you know, so it's really heartening if you're working, if you're doing work in the church and around the church to see new people coming in and, and wanting to be part of what's going on. And I think that that's really true because of the level of communication that occurs. It's a, it's a helpful process, we believe. Even those of us who were part of churches that were bucking the, the system and didn't want to go through the steps that it was trouble, it was worth it because we went through a real structure, a process of discernment with colleagues and, and mentors. And that's what it's about, is to work it through in a way that it's a success in a particular specific church environment. But my, you want to go on to But I was supposed to just say briefly about another part of our work which we're very proud of because the United, in the United Church of Christ to have whole intact congregations wanting to affiliate with us because of who we are as a denomination is somewhat unique in mainstream Protestantism in America today. And there's quite a bit of that going on and it's happening in our conference too. And so um, New Heart was one of the examples of, a few years back of, of a congregation that was already affiliated with the metropolitan community church uh, affiliation but that and, and that, that's a mostly uh, gay lesbian uh, by uh, tradition or it was it was a denomination if you don't know that formed to meet the needs of people that at the time didn't have very many options who felt they kind of outgrew the limited resources that were available in that smaller 
denomination and wanted to have more of a, of a connection with more people and more open and affirming kinds of thinking, main, more main, mainstream. So anyway, they came into, uh, and here they were already a congregation that believed very strongly in tithing and including the tithe to the conference. And, and so, so we're, we're not talking about just struggling churches. We're just sometimes talking about uh, receiving whole communities that really gift us a lot, too. The most recent one that you perhaps, many of you were around last year, to honor and celebrate Liberation United Church of Christ, a Seattle area, mostly African-American, but, but, but a mix of, of racial background also. Um, a church that formed to meet primarily the needs of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people who didn't fit in quite with the black uh, mainstream church experience and yet carried that heritage in some rich, dynamic ways that some of us were just stumbling in and, and learning about how what an exciting, vibrant place it was. And they, uh, the marriage just seemed like a natural one that came together. Uh, I, I tried to introduce but, you know, I tried to introduce the, the Samoan people that are here. They they received a small mini grant because they were so enthusiastic. They wanted to know but how can we get started. Well, we said, well, you, you need to need to come to annual meeting, but it was only two weeks away or whatever. So so we said, well, we'll help make that look because they didn't have the resources to just jump in the car and spend you know, whatever all of us did. Part of the affiliation process is the church that expresses interest getting to know the United Church of Christ and the Pacific Northwest Conference so we can be sure that it's a good fit for both sides. Yes, and um, so this is part of their education process that we were able to give them a mini grant to fund. So they would have a mentor congregation to go through a process just like you would if you were doing a renewal of an existing congregation. But that's another exciting part of our work. And, uh, I don't know if it requires as much discussion or not, but. Uh, I would add, if it's step, stepping on your time, not, uh, if um, there are any questions or ideas that didn't surface about renewal, you know, the table's open to discuss affiliation and renewal. And anything else? Why would a church want to join the UCC yeah. if yeah. they're doing well? Is it that straight? Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because a lot of them feel isolated in terms of resourcing and in terms of a sense of the broader church, of being connected and affiliated with the denomination is not just being a Lone Ranger congregation all alone. If they had to go through a process of uh, pastoral change, for example, they'd have the resources and even a feel, a range of people that they could draw from, that they trust, if they affiliated with a denomination that fits for them. Uh, and, and, and you'd want to say the same thing to all of you in your local churches. To, you may be a strong congregation, but there are times in your life where the tools that are available at the larger church are very valuable. And that's kind of what this, this team is about, trying to network you with broader resources. I, I can actually tell you a, a conversation I had with a member of Liberation uh, UCC Church. She came to our treasurer's training and she said she had been a member of another church, Hope Church, that came together under the AIDS movement and was very vibrant for a period of time. But then the <coughs> pastor of that community passed away suddenly um, and they didn't know what to do. So it just went away. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore because it was one person brought together a great thing but then it didn't have the structure of the community of the conference and the national level. Continuity and, and a lot of independent congregations just don't know how to do those things. Transition. Well, and I was thinking, Michelle, too, this happened in the context of a training for church treasurers. That was probably not something that she had access to as the um, treasurer of liberation before they were affiliated with a larger group. You know, it's a little bit analogous to why would a person, a spiritual person, want to join a church? You can pray at home, you can have a fulfilling spiritual life, but you're not the body of Christ, you're not part of a community. And I think churches hunger to be part of community just as individuals do. Um, and besides the practical resources, you know, it's the fellowship. And New Heart. <coughs> Church is, uh, they're a five for five church, which means they contribute to all five of the offerings. 
Um, so they get to support the global mission, part of the program to help aid themselves. But being a member of UCC, they already have that outlet. Sometimes even large, very independent congregations have, uh, uh, may have a lot of internal resources, but when a crisis is, or when something like training for their treasury, if, if someone was upscounting with money, or, and that can happen in any of your congregations, granted, but, but when you're affiliated, you have people you could trust that to bring in resources that you just don't have in crisis infrastructure. What you said about accountability, I think, is really important. I was speaking to a pastor that was making a presentation from a, an independent congregation, and he was saying, well, I did this, this, and this. And I said, well, how did you get away with that? And he said, I started the church. I can do what I want. Yes, exactly. And, <laughs> and that isn't so when you have those covenant connections. I really appreciate the question, though, because that's really... I mean, it's true. We don't get that in the automatic way. If you don't get it until it happens sometimes, that's too late a lot of them. So. And for a community that may have formed because people in that community came together out of a sense of um, disaffiliation with some part of the spectrum of mainstream Christianity, to find a larger community that um, celebrates their passion for diversity, for mission, all the things that the UCC stands for and does might be particularly attractive to a congregation who feels like they're outliers. Yeah, we've had you know, mainstream Presbyterian groups that, in their conference, for example, didn't be, they were too, they were open and affirming to a degree that most of their colleague churches didn't, they felt not at all. And they, you have to be careful about those things because. We're all brothers and sisters yeah. in Christ. But sometimes people need them. I think we'll see more churches, not necessarily specifically looking to the UCC to affiliate, but maybe looking to affiliate in general. Uh, I know through my, I'm a youth leader also at Normandy Park, so through my youth work and we go out to different parts of the country, you see that while here in Seattle area, Washington area, there is maybe a greater number of progressive Christians. Um, that isn't necessarily the case in other parts of the country. So looking for ways you can bond together, I think is more important. I also <coughs> think that we have an opportunity for affiliation here in Washington because there's so many unchurched folks who maybe are seeking um, a progressive faith voice that they wouldn't be able to find elsewhere but they can find with us where they won't necessarily be shunned or outcast because of X, Y, or Z. Um, but we still have brains, at least in our denomination, that's what I feel is really important. Like, we still ask questions and, and it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to think that science is important as well as faith. So. And some of the immigrant churches that are interested, some of them are coming from us, another kind of situation where if they're a second generation, or beginning to be a second generation English speaking congregation in America, they have a generation gap. And they're struggling, uh, this happens all the time, to, to know who they are in the new generation, in the new country. and. Um, and some of it is, is practical stuff and wanting to have the resources of something like the Cornerstone Fund to build a new church building. You know, that's a very real piece of what sometimes, but then in the course of trying to get that practical need met, they realize that there's a lot of <coughs> other reasons. Not always, I mean, sometimes it's Liberation, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about that is their pastor um, plugged in immediately this conference as a leader in this I mean he's a leader in his church of course he's a leader in this conference so when it's time for renewal of my membership on this committee who's on the telephone it's Pastor Durell well and he doing knows, ministry resources committee work right recruiting right which is just I mean that's the way that's what that's one of the things that happens when you join an organization that has this kind of of infrastructure, superstructure, whatever you want to call it. Tremendous benefit. 
I'm hungry for it. Yeah. I, was, I also want to say, you know, I appreciate the fact that your community has communicated with me so that I can share some of the stories in our conference news. And, you know, so I always feel free to, to do that and, and send me the stories. And it may be related to this or it may be related to all sorts of other aspects of the life of the church. I had um, several contacts this last time with people who were kind of retrofitting their lighting. And so the current issue has a lot of stories of different churches who are, are doing that, what their experiences were. So and I do appreciate when you, you know, are connecting with congregations and share with me so that I can pursue and get a story. And hopefully that helps you too. Oh, we have a huge advocate for you <laughs> sitting right here. She never lets us forget the deadlines. <laughs> She's, I'm a plant. You're a plant. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And although we have lots to do and lots to follow through on, squeaky wheels to a certain extent do get grease. Oh, so, yes. So we, we it's, it's fun to get new inquiries. It's fun to start to engage about real specific grassroots stuff going on or wanting to go on, dreams, hopes. That's, that's the energy of what makes a church a church. And so even if we don't always resolve things, we often can engage enough to get somewhere. Yeah. Speaking of which, any other questions for right now? Okay, so the other leg we do besides renewing with a church, whether they want to refigure their mission or what they're doing, um, or if it's a church in crisis, or if it's um, someone that wants to affiliate and kind of join in, is the other out-of-the-box thinking that we spend a lot of time doing, especially the last few years, is when we say a new church start, we're being a little bit global because um, usually we start the conversation about what is church. And this is the part of our work where we really do say the world has changed, church has changed, how do you do or be or live church in whole different ways. And we're sort of the place, and we love it when it happens, um, because this group likes to be out of the box as much as they're in the box, at least four more, probably. Um, they, we have people that come to us, and they may just be wanting to bounce some ideas off, um, or we may just hear of something that's going on and just send out a little Hello, we're here if you need us. We're excited to hear what you're doing. I think Bob Evans, um, was he at Square first? He's right next to Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> that he, can, he can talk for himself. I think, I don't know if we reached out to you or you reached out to us. Well, I think it was both. Um, everything you said about uh, having contacts, having context with other people, and having actually, uh, how I figure it is power. With uh, because you're affiliated with uh, n not by yourself, you're with a group of people, and uh, I am trying to start a new church in Sandpoint, Idaho, and for all the reasons you said, uh, folks that are out of the box that are um, thinking more what what is now being termed uh, postmodern theological ways, and which is you know. Crossan and Borg and Spong and, and uh, McLaren and, and Rob Bell and all those folks are, are becoming mainstream in a certain way in the public. And, um, and I've tapped into, a, I think, a pretty good little source in Sandpoint, Idaho, which is where I grew up, but it was very conservative at one time, but because of the lake and so on and so forth and different folks moving in there the the culture has changed but the churches have not you see so it's i compare it to the story of the uh, the apostles fishing all night and not catching anything and jesus said well go fish on the right side of the boat or cast your net into deeper water and that's how i look at myself going up there and, you know let's cast the net out a little broader and I think, from my perspective, it's going to go. Yeah. 
uh, it's right now if you've ever camped and you've had a, trouble getting a fire going but you knew it was going to go because they had a nice hot coal and you had some good wood around. That's where we're at. And, um, and we're meeting in a community building? We're, we're, we're meeting in a, actually the chapel of a mortuary. Okay. <laughs> I kind of joked with uh, uh, Bart Casey, the guy who owns the funeral home, said, well, we got the business sewed up here, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're, so they call it partnership. Yeah, it's a partnership thing, but uh, uh, it, it's kind of tough because I'm still finishing out my contract in the, in Kellogg, or Wallace and Osborne there. I won't be done there till the 9th of June. That's my last day. So we're meeting Tuesday nights, and I'm, I've got a lot of folks that can't make it Tuesdays that are waiting till we can do it Sundays. So that's kind of got our, but, but there's a strong core happening, and it's a totally different, it, it isn't traditional. We haven't sung a hymn yet. Um, you know, it's just the way it is. I've got local players come in and do their stuff whatever it is it's blues or folk or classical guitar they come in that's the prelude and um and i start the, with the question from last week somebody will question what do you mean about that so i'll start right there mm -hmm. that's how i start in the announcements you know this was le the question left on the table last week let's approach it and everybody gets to talk about it i give my opinion and this is what I think. It's not what it has to be. This is what I think. And then, and then we start. And then we go through uh, a meditation and so on and so forth. And then I have a, a, a call to worship, which is usually a song called Over the Wall that calls us over our biases. It isn't a red thing. It's a, a song. And then I have the thought for the week. It's not a sermon. It's not a homily. It's a, this, is, this is the scripture. This is what I've been thinking about it. And at the end, well, what do you think? <laughs> you know, and everybody gets to talk. Well, I think, but what do you mean by this? And so on and so forth. And that's the way it ends. I mean, people are still yakking, going out the door. They're on fire for it, you know. Uh, so they're, they want to see it go, and, and they want to be in community. There's even a, a there's a, a what do they call the truth within bunch there were spiritual but not religious they came because of an article in the paper they wanted to come and see what's going on. they're still coming <laughs> so well, we're, getting, we're expecting to get a more full report yeah. from, from yeah. uh, tomorrow that's right. but, uh, so that's a great uh, so that's one example that's, that's a, really that's a great example of something that it, it it bubbled up it's not from the conference but our job is to listen and to you know let him bounce ideas off we may throw some stuff back and keep track and, and we'll all learn from it and then our job is to get that information out to all of the churches and probably through Mary stand actually you know and so, if I can just ask one follow-up question um, but I think you should still have you know take your full time to present but um, so Bob if this isn't putting you on the spot because I don't know how much you've had a chance to think about it yet as someone who's coming to the CDC, what are some of the things that you were hoping would happen or what ways can you imagine we could support you? You know what I mean? Well, as somebody that's just going up there with nothing in hand, I've borrowed a PA system. I would like to be able to have a, a PowerPoint, you know, something to present things with to make worship um, well, people enter computers and things now. That's what they're used to, you know, and I don't have any of that stuff. I'd like to get some equipment. So um, maybe funding, anything Funding, else? yeah, yeah. Um, well, advertisement, funding for that and funding for advertisement. A thing I see about, uh, you have to be an entrepreneur, you know, really is what you're being. And so, and advertisement is key because there's a lot of people, I think, would come out of the woodwork if they knew what was going on. So that's... So, so another example, which is totally different, is uh, Lisa Donkey came from University Congregational UCC. 
And um, she wasn't asking for anything. She was just letting us know and educating us on what she's thinking of doing, which is starting a whole different kind of church, which will be sort of a daughter church of, of university in some ways. It'll be a totally different group of people probably. And I'm doing this from memory because I couldn't find my notes. But basically, she she has this vision of reaching out to people who wouldn't go near a church building at all, a little bit, some of your folks. Um, one of the meetings, she's going to have four meetings a week, one, uh, four meetings a month. One would be a actual worship service. One will be held in a tavern, um, an ale house, and that, we don't know what form it would be, but it's intentionally put somewhere else in a non-church setting. Um, and then another one, which is going to be down at Magnuson, or again in a non-church um, setting, was spiritual practices. Helping people who don't necessarily want to go to church, many of whom say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. But they want to have, they want to practice some kind of life pattern. Some, you know, and, and who knows what that's going to be. And at this point, she wasn't asking for funding. She was just sort of letting us know that this was bubbling up. And um, at some point, I think the university is, is going to put some funding in. We might put funding in, or we might just be there to bounce ideas off of. He actually asked her to come and uh, talk to us. Uh, it, it was interesting. I was at a, at a uh, Jesus seminar meeting at the university, at the university congregation alumni. And some of the members of the university were talking about this and the church that she was forming. And then Dan and I started talking about it, and he heard about it. And we started talking about, well, shouldn't we have her come and talk to us? Yeah, we'd like to have that, because it would be good for us to know, so that somebody should ask us, what is going on out there, and do you know any place that I can plug in? We have an example for you of a place that's working at. And now, so there's two examples um, where you two could network and bounce ideas off each other, and you know that's another benefit of um, having a committee like this, but also a benefit of being part of a larger community. And, and in full disclosure, the UCC has not had a great track record in this particular subcategory of our work in the past. So where we have had some success is when an existing strong congregation was hosting or sponsoring, and so there was a link nearby. And that's not to say it can't happen, but this, we've had more success with affiliated congregate, existing congregations or renewal of existing congregations than we have with brand new church starts. But we're still, we're doggedly interested in this because we should be, and we, it's exciting, and we have our, you know, we have our expectations here too before we start pouring up. You know, well, which, as <laughs> we go through a process in all, in all Let me kind of check this out with Michelle and you, Dan, but um, with Mike Denton as our conference minister now, I believe, I haven't been on that long, but I believe the Church Development Committee used to have a smaller scope and was mainly focused on renewal grants and the idea of supporting churches um, in other ways and doing affiliations and new starts instead of all that being on the conference minister. Mike has really taken an approach to empowering this committee to um, helping churches through those processes. So um, our role is expanded. The we can't just throw money if I'd like right. to just add, I just went to a Subvert the Norm conference in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, uh, what? Subvert the Norm. <laughs> um, Jack Caputo and some, some, well, good names were there. Could you do a workshop on that? Cause I that. Uh, yeah, no, but um, I think, seriously, in, uh, that the UCC is positioned very well. Uh, there's, I, I feel that it, I'm one of those. I came to the UCC because I was outside the box, okay? So, so I feel... I was say, half, half of us in this room did. <laughs> well, uh, 
I just feel that if we play our cards right, you know, I really do feel if we play our cards right in places like, you, you've got to file, find them, you've got to feel them out because there's not, there will, there'll be places where they're just, there's a lot of people, but there may not be any place for them to go. You just got to feel it there and be brave enough to start it. Uh, that's part of the game, I guess. Yeah, you. You know. And it's sort of a circle because in the in the previous way old days, it was the whole focus was on starting new churches, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and planting them and parachuting people. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question about that. Do um, from the committee level, do you ever does someone? What I imagine happens, and I know a little about this, is that someone will come to you and say, "I'm interested in starting a church in this place." Do you ever? come to someone and say, look, uh, this town was 100,000 people 10 years ago. Now it's 200,000 people. Um, we have one church in this town. Think you could start a church here? If, well, does that happen? We talk to about the that person, a lot. If we find a person, but that's the trick. You know, yeah. um, Ellensburg comes to mind because they haven't had one. But, but you have that at the community level, at the committee level where you say, wow, this place is a really attractive option for us. So you're you're, you're consciously looking for things in a community that make it uh, ripe for a UCC church. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah but there, there are the, the, the problematic side of the history is simply that there are would be entrepreneurs who might not have the spiritual gifts of the pastor or mm -hmm. uh, spiritual gifted pastors who don't have the entrepreneur. It takes a very, very special, special <laughs> individual that we don't have a lot of to just pull, hey, you go over here. But yes, we do that. We try to look into that, those demographics, and think about that a lot, and pray about it. But to get there is all of it. I'm just trying to put it into a perspective. Of and, and there have been some churches that we started that didn't go. You That's know, exactly right. You know, there yeah. was one in Moses Lake that yes. was an that. There yes. was one also, yes. uh, you know, it was it was out uh, between Spokane and Spokane Valley right. that was, you know. Oh. That, let me learn from that too. Do you mind my asking what are the, aside from, um, for instance, recent population growth, um, there being a very uh, high population to, say, UCC member in the community, um, what are the attributes of a community that you look for when you say this place is ready for a UCC church? What, what do you see? Sure. We all have opinions. Quantitatively, about, right? what? And Bob, you know, what? Bob's done some of that very recently. You have to know, are there other liberal communities of, 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 of faith already in the area? Of it, and how you define liberal is uh -huh. a question, sure. Um, um, but I think definitely um, the main criterion would be, do people who need our brand of Christianity, are they being served in this ge geography? You know what I mean? Are there places um, that embrace sexual diversity where people can worship? Or is there just a dearth of that? You know, it's, it is kind of evangelism and it's a ministry to see who's not being served. Right? Absolutely. I say too, I think that um, as a denomination and as a well, I've aged out of being a young adult, but I still like to think I'm a young adult. But she has, no, she has to be still young adult. This is state of mind. I think that we're going to have to think about church in a different way. Like, I have friends, and they happen to be um, Methodist, not UCC, but they're doing a home church in the Capitol Hill area. And I look at everything that Valley Mountain is doing, and I'm like, that's so awesome. I can't believe they're not part of our denomination. Um, just because everything that they're doing matches with what the UCC. So how could the UCC do something like that? I mean, my parents live in South King County. There is no UCC church, and yet there's like 100,000 people that live there. Why isn't there a UCC church there? Or how could we foster it? So um, the questions that you're asking are great because I think that's what our committee is asking, and I think that's what we should ask if we're going to be a relevant church in the future because I think we have there's lots of opportunity and I think we're growing that way but I think if we don't all get on board with having this conversation you know there's reasons you sometimes see lots of gray hair which is awesome I'm not saying anything about 
anti gray hair by that means. But I think Thank if you. we don't <laughs> if we don't start having bigger, more relevant conversations and get and move all of us there. Yeah. And some of it needs to be ecumenical. We have a, mm -hmm. a, a start in Spokane called the Oak Tree. Yes. And it's uh, Methodist and Lutheran and uh, also uh, and, and two Methodist churches in transition and a Lutheran church that's fairly stable there. And, but, and, and then there was an Episcopal church in the neighborhood that was involved. But they're doing a whole community outreach with community gardens, with, I mean, so it's not just coming and sitting, but it's, it's really, you know, discussion groups and studies that lead to community action. And it's based on being a social justice oriented, you know, group. And they're looking at trying to get a contract to maintain the property that has been bought, the homes have been bought, and the land has been cleared, and the Department of Transportation needs property maintained. They want to maintain it by building community gardens. So, you know, doing church can be a whole different kind of thing than, than just gathering or singing or, you know. Increasingly, there's projects out there in a, in a in conversation with the United Church of Christ, rather than claiming the name as we're a UCC church, that's premature sometimes. But but there's a lot of projects out there, experiments that that want to have this this networking, and we we'd like to encourage. It, so. And I know. Oh, I was just going to say too, and I really um, admire your um, search for metrics and quantitative data. I'm a facts and data person. Thank um, God. We need a real mix. We have a real mix. <laughs> <We're laughs> <in. laughs> you know, but, um, being as we're church, and especially that we're UCC, um, you know, it's a lot involving discernment and maybe not as quantitative as some other, you know, I think from a social science standpoint, it's really important to measure whether things are successful or not. Um, but in our denomination, it's also a lot of times more fluid than that. So you may not be looking at the census or the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. You may be looking at more We might be looking at that, you know, um, <coughs> with the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. We might have um, the demographics in one hand and the spirit in the other. So where is the spirit moving for quantitative and other reasons? There, I was a professional musician for 19 years or so, playing out of Nashville. And the question when I was young and uh, back there was, uh, and you walk in a studio, a lot of times they'd ask you, well, can you read music? This is your data part, see? And the answer was, well, not enough to foul up my plan. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, it's in both hands. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not in either one. Do you think that we need to? Um, okay. Well, just a quick comment. I was on this same committee like 25 years ago when I lived here before, and I think there's been a a great shift in thinking because as the UCC as a denomination has gelled more and found more of what its identity is. At that time, the argument was, do we even want to reach out and start new churches because we don't really believe in evangelism. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And that was the big fight, not fight, but the big rub in the committee at that time. We don't really need to start new churches, and we don't do that anyway. That's what the fundamentalists do. And now things have changed to the point where I think we found more of what our niche, what our identity is. And now Again, we feel like we have something to offer to people. Well, well, yeah, but it's five years ago, there was another um, aspect of the UCC that was working on evangelism. Yeah. And now there's a lot of communication, whether it was um, embodying it. <laughs> churches. There's another story. <laughs> <It> was, <yeah. laughs> but I'm, I'm so pleased to see you, what you've evolved to become. It's, um, it's wonderful to see. It's funny that you say evangelism because I don't like that word myself. Right. Um, I, I don't feel like I'm evangelizing. I feel like I'm there as a place for people that already want to be some place for. You see, I'm not going door to door. I'm just saying 
hey all in fact part of my web page says when it says uh, no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey if you're one of these if you're LGBT so on and so forth one of my lines if you're spiritual but not religious you're welcome here too <laughs> see it's, it's just a place it's to providing to, safety exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. I like to think that we are reclaiming the E word and that it doesn't necessarily mean you proselytize and now we're kind of going up the I-5 corridor. So um, if you're from a church that's farther away from the metro area and don't feel as connected to the conference, you know, we love to visit these little outlying clusters of churches. So far it's just been Washington State. Um, and it's amazing. And basically what we do, first we explain to people who we would like to invite us that we're not there to check up on them. <laughs> and then when we get there, mostly we just listen. You know, and we hear their wonderful stories, we hear their frustrations, we hear their dreams. Um, and, you know, we want to be in partnership with everybody who approaches us like that. And, you know, we're a lot more than a funding source, although we do make recommendations to the board of directors for funding projects. But we get as inspired as as the churches do from us. I mean, and then we hope we share that back up. That's why it's a great group to be on. Yeah. So, so, so as the chair of the outreach committee at the First Congregational Church of Bellingham, um, I would love like getting funding for our outreach stuff and then hearing best practices. Is that the kind of thing that you would want to, as your visit thing, we could talk about? And Bellingham is on our list for coming up month this Gee, we just happen to be dropping it here. <laughs> <laughs> We like Wasn't good food. Maybe so. I didn't know that yeah. they were the only Finnish UCC congregation in the denomination, and now we've visited them. And they used to actually have service in Finnish. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's... Uh, and I was a first congregational in Astoria, which was a Finnish congregation. Oh, really? And used to have services in uh -huh. Finnish. Yeah. So, and, and that's so fascinating. And we're always growing, and one of the things we're thinking about doing more is like hosting, like like a, a cluster of congregations that could jointly develop, a, have a have a consultation, a person who might help with a visioning, future visioning stuff. Because a number of our churches have fairly similar struggles, and it's hard to always get around to everybody adequately. Well, <laughs> and um, so there are some things we played with in the past, like small church. Practices, things like that. But and that's what, have you thought about? Um, you know, we have all this wonderful equipment, technology equipment, and we and the goal is to get somewhere on the east side. Yeah. But you know, there might be possibilities if you're thinking outside of the box. If you can't physically go there, you can connect right. people yeah. to be in rooms in different places yeah. and we're connect congregations. That. We're doing that with the committee. Our uh -huh. meetings, because we have. Judith, uh, Judith. Judith. So yeah, and Nick Castro is at uh, Moscow, Idaho. Moscow, Idaho. So yeah, well, we're, we're Skype. Yeah, yeah. Well, go to meetings. But there's also the, the there's also, but there's also the the actual kind of live streaming stuff that our conference has. That's what we're using. Go to meetings. meetings. Go to meetings. That's what yeah. we're using. Yeah, yeah. So we could do that with. We have not yet done that with a church group. And, yeah, but you know, it, it, it's the challenge is that you also have churches that do not have right. good right. enough connection anywhere in their county yes. Yes. Right. to provide yes. that yes. service right. to me. Right. Well, and um, actually one of the things that was mentored and mentioned in the Center for Progressive Renewal webinar that I handed out something from is that even as we become high tech, we need to stay yes. high touch. Mm -hmm. And for a community that's reaching out, oh, I wonder if they could help us, feel kind of shy about even approaching us or wonder or don't have an idea for a project but just really need a lifeline, you know, going to them or meeting face to face when feasible um, is a nice way to make a connection. Technology, of course, is also a wonderful extension yes. of that when it's when, when, it's, when it works. When it's yeah. 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 The churches in uh, Maisel and Kathleen who visited last year, um, these are churches. These guys, a lot of them used to work in the woods. Big Finnish guys that were that were really expecting uh, to be with this church forever and ever. They were really concerned. 
that they wanted to die before the church did so there could be a church and a pastor to take care of the details. You know, this is a very sad situation. When we walk into these these two groups and meetings, and just by having people come and say hello and listen to them and talk to them and hear what they're talking about, I mean the the general the general energy level in those rooms as we left had turned completely around. It was just absolutely amazing. What I'm showing it just to show the pride of what's going on. Of their heritage. And the conference knows they exist and that they matter. Well, I right. think that's really the spirit at work. I was wondering maybe what the room thought. If there's an area that has a UCC church that's really unhealthy, like they have no energy or they have a lot of conflict or they just kind of want to be taken care of, is it which is cheaper and easier to go in and try and revitalize that one or just start something completely new? I think it depends on the people in the church. I'll take a concrete example like Kirkland where it was really a desperate situation and we visited them just to start with, to see what was going on there, we ran into four of the most inspired people who really wanted this church to go on. This church was founded in 18. It was the first church like on that. the east side. And, and as one of them put it, she says, I don't want to be on the committee that turns the lights off in this place. You know, we, we want this to happen. We want this church to go forward. Motivated people. Now, if that's not there, if they're in the one of the things in that handout that Becky handed us here was developing leadership, strong lay leadership. If that strong lay leadership isn't present, then it's it's a very dicey situation what's going to happen next. But also, I mean, we do have a commitment to existing UCC churches. Now, that commitment could be to help them close their doors gracefully and get them through that grieving process and such. But basically, we're not in the business of seeking out churches that are so troubled that we would come in and initiate them coming to an end. So, but what I, I think, if I'm understanding your question, but if there is a UC church in the community, it's not doing well, but is that then community hands off? Before starting, if there's somebody else who wants to start using mm. the church, we, I think we that's what you had, might have been saying. We've had that uh, um, a group come from, from a different area in the state, and someone really had the energy to do something that was very different than what was going on at that church. And it, and there was a lot of just gentle negotiation, and have you talked with so-and-so, have you talked with so-and-so, and just letting people kind of communicate and be in a buffer, um, but there's no prejudgment of, you know, if, if the spirit moves and the spirit's moving for some people in a different direction, then you just, you, you gotta. Yeah, the, the, we all have different biases. We're all individuals here. I mean, I, I feel pretty protective of existing congregations that are sometimes dismissed as, as dysfunctional because you can't kill congregations easily and sometimes there's a core, just like the Quaker talk, Quakers talk about the inner light, congregations have an inner light too and sometimes it's pretty buried because all you can see is the dysfunction or it feels like that. But in fact in American history, in, in all our denominations, and this is true of the new immigrant churches too, it's divided and conquered. I mean they're constantly spent splitting. And, and, that, and when I went to Korea, that was the model of the congregation. I, I, I spent time with the pastor. When they had a covenant when they formed a congregation that if they became a hundred members, they would send 20 of their people off to start a new congregation. Mm -hmm. They decided that it's from the get-go. And so dividing and like cells, that's one thing, to to, to get a, 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 dis, a disaffiliated grunt, you know, angry group to split off, that's more often what happens, I'm afraid. So I would I my bias is to at least work pretty hard at seeing if there's something. I'm saying if you got like a general. dynamic young person coming up and wants to do something, mm -hmm. you know, has the charisma and the whatever, you know, all the all all, all the, the skills for for, for for 
for having the church. Yeah. So I think the by, ideal you know, like, scenario would be for some some kind of partnership where the existing church would be willing to shift resources or have that be like an adjunct. You know what I mean? Ideally, that person could come in and make things happen in the community without that necessitating that the you know former things entirely die. Can I give a real life example? Absolutely. So, if you have one, uh, that's great. Yeah. I was just a and we're all out of time too, so if anybody yeah. has to leave I understand. Um Plymouth hosted a worship workshop about a month ago and um, Plymouth UCC in downtown in downtown Seattle. Seattle. Mm -hmm. So, and they, it was really geared towards what they are looking to do at Plymouth, but they invited people to come. So, Lon and I went, and it's, um, I'm not, Woodstone, I think is the name of the congregation, but I'm not going to remember, but they're in Nashville. They wanted to add another type of service, so they, under their umbrella of Woodstone, operate, um, and Bridges is coming to mind, that's not probably the name of it at all. But they have another service that's completely run by different people. And it's different, and it's at their, it's not a separate congregation, but they have, they've rebranded themselves and come together at like five o'clock on Sunday and have this dynamic, whole different thing. And it's came out of their congregation, but it's kind of some younger folks who offer different music, et cetera, and it's really exciting to me. And it would be maybe what you're talking about where um, an idea was born out of an existing congregation, but they wanted to do something completely different. And it's working. And because it's working, they have like another 100 people that are coming to their congregation, I mean, collectively, and, and it's completely viable. I think it's kind of exciting. Well, and it's a little bit what Lisa's doing at mm -hmm. university because they'll be they'll hold different populations. Um, one of the one of the things you'll hear on on CDC, by the way, is that we have it's a pretty even mix of ministers and lay people, and which makes for a very lively conversation sometimes. <laughs> and more people could be on CDC. It's a it's a great team to be on. It's they have we, honest, be, It's a lot of fun. You can nominate your or have a, someone of your congregation nominate or something. Right here this weekend. It's way fun. We should travel. <laughs>